All righty, you guys ready to kick this thing off? Let me turn my cell phone off really fast. Maybe. All right, hopefully everybody off site can hear me. I think I'm set to go. All right, so I was kind of telling the guys here in class while I was getting set up, I will be sending out an email to you guys today to the group, and I will forward it to Chief Isaacson, and then with Coraline Fire, I'll forward it to the captains and BCs, talking about your clinical stuff. Um, I, anything that we've covered in class, clinical-wise, like the IVs, um, I'm fine with you practicing out in the field, but before you do that, I want you to practice on like an IV arm or a mannequin first with a medic or uh, I-85. And as long as they're comfortable with how you're doing it on the mannequin, then I am fine with you doing it on calls, on patients. Um, so you're to that phase. But please don't, don't have the first time you actually have a needle in your hand sticking somebody be the patient. Please do it on the mannequin first. Um, but otherwise, there's no formal sign-off that you get um, you don't have to have a minimum number of sticks. Um, it's just all about you just getting the hands-on practicing. The only official sign-off you have to have is your NREMT exam where you actually go in and do the skill on a mannequin. Um, but there is no other sign-off on your IVs. So. But please don't do anything that we haven't covered in class. Don't work ahead. Yeah. Uh, just for the other day when we were talking about it, you said that we may have to change our skill set. I'm not following your question. Uh, there's so, a, so there's going to be, at least for our guys, they're going to have a, a, their, another name associated as students. Oh, OK. Advanced, like advanced student. Right, that way they can document that they did it. Yeah. Um, that would be fine. I would also be fine. Whatever a, um, I-85 or medic is precepting you, if put their name down and they're just in the narrative, put you know, put their name in the flowchart. Um, that way it doesn't, you know, there's, does that, that doesn't draw any red flags. But in the narrative, describe that the student did it with whoever watching. I'm fine with it either way. But I haven't specifically talked to KCMS or anybody about it. So. All right, questions about that? But yeah, um, that email should come out today. So at least then you'll have documentation showing that you're good to go. All right, so today we're going to go over BLS now. With this particular group, this is a very quick and easy chapter. I mean, you guys have been doing BLS for years and years and years. There's nothing crazy fancy at this next level of um, your EMT licensure with BLS. Even in the medic level, there's not much we do it for BLS anymore. It's all back to compressions, 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 compressions. So we'll talk about that. We'll go the lecture. It, I'm thinking maybe an hour lecture. Um, and then that'll be it for the lecture, which will be good for you guys. The most important thing I need you guys to remember, though, in this class regarding BLS is the fact that the National Registry uses AHA guidelines. Cooney County EMS, we do the high-performance CPR. Okay, That's not adopted by the Heart Association yet. So any test question that you have is not going to be high-performance CPR. It's going to be AHA guideline stuff. So don't get confused with what we do in Kootenai County with what you're going to be tested on for this class. Okay, Just make sure you understand that. Even though how we practice here is different than this information, this is information what you're being tested on. All right, so um, CPR has been around for a long, long, long time. They, According to this, is kind of started back in the 1960s. But with the initial recommendations or guidelines of what they use for CPR, do you guys have any idea where those even came from? It was purely speculation. It was guesses. Like, well, we think this will work. Um, as far as like the numbers and the ratio from compressions to ventilations, all that, it was pure guessing, kind of based off of 
um, what normal human physiology was and what they thought would work, but they really didn't know. And they didn't have really good ways back then to really study it, to see how effective it was. So because of that, you know, see, nowadays we have a lot of ability to, you know, really get in there and study the blood flow during CPR on cadavers and animals and stuff. So it's been changed a lot. But even with that, it still changes every five years. Um, and the Heart Association, the um, American Heart Association is the one that does most of those guideline recommendations for CPR. But do you know how that whole system works with how they change their recommendations? So they bring hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people together to these big conferences. There's doctors, nurses, medics, I mean, a whole bunch of different groups of care providers. And they all come, and there's a handful of them that are actually asked to present research that they've been doing. A lot of people from different universities and stuff. And they all present their research and their new recommendations on what they think they could, should do. And then in the end, it's basically a vote where they decide what they're going to go with and what they're not. And I kind of learned that information from a doctor in Seattle. He is one of the main doctors of the, um, is it the Seattle Resuscitation Institute, I think? It's through um, Seattle Fire Department. He is one of their medical directors. Dr. Kudinchuk, very, 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 very smart guy. And his passion is BOS. Well, I had the opportunity to go sit in a, what was it, three or four day class of his. And he is one of the guys across the country that is really, 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 really pushing high performance CPR and has tons and tons and tons and tons of data to back up his research. He is also one of the prominent guys that goes to this convention at the AHA. Well, he really thought this last go round he was going to get high performance um, CPR pushed through the AHA and he could not get the votes. He could not get him to bite off on it. Um, so that's why there's some discrepancy with different people out there with how they do CPR because you have different experts with different opinions and it's just a matter of getting the, the big organizations like the American Heart Association to bite off on it. So that's kind of how that works. Um, do you guys know, I don't even actually know, do you know when the next CPR, the HA um, convention is? I don't know how, what year we are into our last into the cycle. It's got to be coming up soon though, but I'm not positive. Then usually after they meet and make their recommendations, it's usually at least a year or two before the changes really take effect by the time they print all new materials and send out the stuff. And, and then there's some of us that are, you know, the conspiracy theorists that believe they truly change stuff every five years just so they can sell more books. But anyhow. Okay, so in the end though, of all the different people that do CPR and study CPR, what has kind of consistently been the number one indicator of survivability of CPR? What is the most important thing? Compressions. Early compressions, lots of compressions, and compressions, compressions. All the things they study, that is the one thing that makes the biggest difference. And then what would be number two in that list? Uh, a defibrillator, yep. Those are the two biggest things that are going to make any difference whether you survive a cardiac arrest or not. Um, and then obviously, this slide says good teamwork is important. And that really obviously depends on the environment you work in. In EMS, it's actually a little bit easier to have that good teamwork compared to other like hospital settings even, or out of the hospital, and why is that? Why is teamwork better in our, our world? You work with the same guys. On your shift, you're, I mean, there's always variations, but you're usually working with the same guys, or gals, or whoever it is, but the same people. And that really aids in your teamwork, because on really on most calls, do you even have to tell each other what to do? No, everybody knows their job, and they just do it. That's not the case in everywhere you work. Even in the hospital, when I worked there, we worked kind of with the same people, but not really. There was always different people coming and going with different shifts because you don't work the same shift schedule. There's a whole bunch of different shifts. So even throughout the day, people are coming and going. It's a different group of people. Different people are working different days. And every time you worked a, like a code, it was always a different group of people in the room. Well, obviously, if you have a different group of people, the dynamics are different, the leadership is different, and it's more chaotic. And you guys probably see that just when you work on a different shift. You pick up an overtime shift or trade and you're on a different shift and you're in a code or a sick patient. It doesn't feel the same. 
even though the care is probably the same, it just doesn't feel the same because you don't have that same teamwork. So in BLS, teamwork is really, 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 really important. Okay, so elements of BLS, they focus on the A, B, C, D, E's. So traditionally it was airway, breathing, circulation, um, disability, which is what? What does that stand for? At the level of consciousness, is, I don't know why it's ended up with disability, but it's basically um, level of consciousness. But with cardiac arrest, it's different. It's not A, B, C, D, E's. What is it? It's a, yep, compressions come first. So it's um, compressions, airway, breathing, disability, and then the E's exposure is what the E is. Um, so compressions first, then work on the airway, breathing, see, um, even though technically, it's kind of funny how they put the disability you know, towards the end there, because what do you always make sure you do before you start CPR? Is the patient conscious, right? Because you're not going to start CPR. So really, that should be number one, but they don't want you to be thinking in your head that that's the priority. The priority is compressions, 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 compressions. And the faster you can identify somebody that needs CPR and start compressions, the better. What if you're just not 100% sure? Do it. You're going to cause less harm by doing compressions to somebody that doesn't need it than you will not be doing not doing compressions on somebody that needs it. Now, if their heart's pumping and you're doing compressions, are you doing it any good? No, I mean, you're not helping it, but are you really gonna cause permanent damage to their heart by doing CPR? No, you're not. So yeah, if, if you can't tell, and there's, there are those cases where it's just really, really hard to tell. Like, man, do I feel a pulse? I'm not sure I feel a pulse. I don't think I do, but man, was it? If you don't know, don't spend a whole lot of time dinking around, just start compressions. What's your maximum amount of time you can spend trying to figure it out, according to the AHA? 10 seconds. You got 10 seconds. If you don't know by 10 seconds, you're on the chest doing compressions. Okay? Um, maybe. I don't know. My experts on this are not here. Oh, let's see here. Screen. But this guy? No. Start sharing my screen. Isn't that on his end? Doesn't he just scoot the screen over his end? I don't have any idea. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's how you do it. Well, it, sa it says no one sees your screen. Why? Did that work? Let me know if it's still not working, because I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay, so cardiac arrest. Person not breathing in, heart's not pumping, but ultimately what's killing them? It comes back to our very first lecture we had with pathophysiology. The cells are not getting oxygen. I mean, that is what's killing them off. It's down to the cellular level, okay? So the brain cells start dying almost immediately um, without oxygenation. How long does it take for permanent brain damage to occur without oxygenation? Uh, four to six without oxygen. Four to six, you can start having permanent brain damage. When you think about that, that is why bystander CPR is so, so, so important. How often are we on scene from the time of arrest within four to six minutes? Practically never. Shoot, it takes dispatch four to six minutes half the time, it seems like, to get a cardiac arrest call paged out. I mean, it's really not that long, but it seems like it takes forever. Um, so it, it beats, eats up a lot of time. And then our drive time and getting there, and even if you look at our numbers, you know, are our numbers real life when it talks about arriving on scene and starting compressions? No, because when do we pick arrival? You're getting close, pulling up, right? Well, then you still have to find a place to park the rig, park it, get your stuff out, get all your gear, get in the house, find the patient, and then start compressions. That's probably a whole other minute there, at least, if you look at our times. So these four to six minutes get eaten up super, 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 super fast. Now, does that mean people aren't going to survive if they've been down longer than four to six minutes? No, it just means that they may have some permanent brain damage, but the extent of that it varies greatly. And some people have no noticeable brain damage. 
It's not that it's a definite going to, it's just that it's a possibility. Now let's see if that takes away their screen now that I go back to that. Okay, so in um, doing CPR, so basically what we're establishing is making sure that we are pumping blood for them because their heart's not pumping blood and making sure that we have an open airway and are breathing for them, okay? So what are our methods to open up the airway? T typically it's just a head tilt chin lift, right? Unless you suspect trauma, then we're doing the jaw thrust. So just, you know, what are the situations where, I mean, obviously an obvious trauma you know, you know, you know, if they're laying at the bottom of a ladder or something. But most of the time we don't know. But there's a few special circumstances where you just assume it's trauma. And one of those would be like a swimming pool. If you pull somebody out of a swimming pool, it's probably, you know, just a drowning. But they always want you to treat that like a spinal cord injury. In case they, you know, dove in, hit the bottom. So there's a few circumstances like that that even though you really don't know, assume it's trauma until you can prove otherwise. All right. So then... Um, and again, this is per the HA. So um, the first thing you do is you open your airway doing the head tilt chin left or jaw thrust. What's the next step? So um, I, I, we kind of, actually we kind of, I'm already into the CPR part of it. So initially you're right. So initially you would have gotten there, made sure that they were unresponsive. Okay, they're not responsive. Then you're going to check for pulse and listen look listen feel for breathing no pulse no breathing then you're gonna open your airway okay um do you give rescue breaths at this point at this point for this you just go this first cycle you don't you go straight into compressions you used to but all they want you to do now is open the airway and go into the chest your second round is when you'll give your breaths okay um how many compressions are we doing for per aha 30 and then what 30 to, and two breaths yep and what is your rate of compressions per minute? Or how many about should you be, you be getting per minute? 100 to 120. And that actually, those numbers are very, 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 very important. Um, back to this Dr. Um, Kudenchuk, when you look at the data that he does in the studies that they've done, it is very, very, very clear that if you get less than 100 or if you get over 120, the survivability rates really drop off. Um, that is just the sweet spot where you're getting the best circulation. What do you think we tend to do, too fast or too slow? Too fast. We tend to do too fast initially, and then as the group gets tired, too slow. But initially, too fast. We do too fast at compressions, and we breathe too fast. And both of those are killing our patients or helping, helping them kill themselves. Um, so, yeah, make sure you're slowing down your compressions and your breathing. But what do we have at our fingertips nowadays that helps us with that? Yeah, our cardiac monitors will help us with that because they will let you know as long as you're using those, you know, special CPR CPR pucks, kind of give you that real-time data. All right, and so you've done your initial 30 compressions. Now you're going up make, again, making sure the airway's open and giving your two rescue breaths. Now with the breathing, um, what method are you using to do the breathing? Uh, it, yeah, a bag valve mask, or you're using a mouth to mask, or you're using, what are you using? In real life, what do we use? Okay, what does the AHA want you to use? Or do they care? Really, the, they'll say if you're a lone rescuer, the very best thing for a lone rescuer is a, like a pocket mask, especially if it's hooked up to oxygen. They'll say you get, you'll get the best oxygenation to your patient with a lone rescuer with a pocket mask. Because the BVM, it's a little more difficult to get that good mass seal and jump in between compressions and that and compressions and that, compressions and that. They say it's easier with a pocket mask. I don't know if they'll get that much into a test question for you. I would kind of be surprised if they throw that at you. But if you have the choice and you're a lone rescuer, don't choose the BVM. Choose a pocket mask. All right. Um, let me all right, so the chain of survival, according to the Heart Association, the recognition of cardiac arrest or potential cardiac arrest, immediate high-quality CPR, 
rapid defibrillation, BLS and ALS skills, and then post-arrest care. Okay, so if any part in that chain is um, broken, the likelihood of survival is less and less and less. So when we're doing a cardiac arrest, we're at a cardiac arrest care and we're treating care of the patient, there's some other things to think about besides just the BLS. So we've already got our in you know, the airway, we've got the breathing taken care of through our BVM, we're doing compressions. What do you need to be start thinking about at that point? Start thinking about the causes, right? Why are they in cardiac arrest? Is there anything more besides just compressions we can do to correct the situation? Now, oftentimes there's not, and there's only a few things in the field we can do anyway to correct the H's and T's. So you guys all know what the H's and T's are? At least kind of have an idea of some of them. All right, so um, hypovolemia. Now, little old lady that would go on to cardiac arrest laying in her living room, are you thinking hypovolemia? Maybe. Maybe she's had um, diarrhea for a few days. Maybe she's been throwing up. Don't only associate hypovolemia with blood loss. Um, there's a lot of illnesses that can also cause them to be hypovolemic. So what are you going to do for that while well, you're doing cardiac arrest? Yeah, give them a fluid bolus, right? And that's not just getting an IV started and having a bag just hanging there. I mean, that is literally get a large bore IV, take your bag of fluid and have somebody like squeeze in that bag or have a pressure bag on it and try to really get them the fluid. Because um, if, if during the cardiac arrest, you know, what do we typically work in arrest before we call it on most, most cases? About 20 so minutes. If you're just having an IV just drip in, you're not even going to get enough volume in 20 minutes to make any difference unless you're really getting that volume pushed in fast. So if you're thinking hypovolemia, get the fluid in. Hypoxia, how are you treating that? Yeah, we got oxygen on board, right? So that's an easy one to fix. All right, hydrogen ion or acidosis. So we're fixing that. You're going to fix acidosis in the middle of a cardiac arrest? Not really. The best thing we're going to do to fix it is what? It, it, at a medic level, you can get bicarb. Um, otherwise, it's just oxygenation and breathing for them and get the right rate of breathing. That's, if it's not that, that's not going to fix it, you're not going to fix that during a cardiac arrest. Um, hypo or hyperkalemia, you're going to fix that during arrest? No, we might throw calcium at them again at the medic level. It's not going to fix them. Um, hypothermia, though. This we could help. Um, are we very good at treating this in cardiac arrest? No, we're awful. What do we do with them? Strip their clothes off, or at least their top half of their clothes off. We're doing compression. They're laying on a cold floor. But think about it. If you really think hypothermia is contributing to their cardiac arrest, we need to be thinking of that. That's much easier to control in the back of an ambulance than it is in a person's house, even though that's not usually where they're at. Because then we could crank the heat up to high to the point where we're all miserable and sweating and hopefully warm the patient up. Um, Hypoglycemia. How about this one? This is an easy one to fix, right? Can we and we can easily assess it during a cardiac arrest, and we typically do. Uh, so you find out that you're doing a cardiac arrest, they're hypoglycemic. Then what? At your level, as an advanced CMT, what are you going to do? What what kind of dextrose? Okay, yep, you're going to just put D50 fluids and get them going in. Okay. Um, okay. Now the other ones are tend to be more trauma related, but not always, but they tend to be, and they're much harder for us to fix in the field. Um, so attention pneumothorax is a, some of the T's. So now we have that lining in the lung where you're getting air and stuff in that lining of the lung, compressing the lungs down. Only one way to fix that is what? At least in the field, it's a needle decompression at a medic level. Um, I have never, knock on wood, never been on a cardiac arrest patient where I thought that was the cause yet. Uh, cardiac tamponade, the same kind of thing, but around the heart. We cannot fix that in the field anymore. That is a rapid transport to the hospital if we think that's what it is. But I'll be honest with you. If cardiac tamponade cardi caused their arrest, they're dead. I mean, you would have to be in the hospital with a physician ready to fix that 
before, you know, right as you arrested for you to survive that. If you've already gone into cardiac arrest, you're, they're not going to get it fixed in time. Um, okay, and then toxins. What are they mean, talking about toxins? Yeah, overdose. So what, what, what are they exposed to? What, you know, are you looking around? What pills are they on? Is this a, so what is the number one medication you think that comes to mind with me that I can treat that I want to know about with a toxin? Yeah, opioids, right. Is it, um, can I fix that? Not necessarily, but we're still going to treat it. What are we going to give? We're going to give Narcan. Is it going to completely change them around and, you know, save the, the cardiac arrest? Probably not, but we're still going to treat it. Okay, and then the other T is thrombosis, and there's two of these, pulmonary or coronary. So what is a um, pulmonary thrombosis? Where is the blood clot? It's, it's most often in the lungs, but it's in the vasculature in the lungs. But it also could be one of the big vessels if it's a huge clot, but that, and that would definitely cause a cardiac arrest if it was a big vessel. Um, but yeah, it's somewhere in the vasculature of the lungs bef or between the lungs and heart. And then a coronary thrombosis, we call what? Or it's just a heart attack, right? A coronary thrombosis. And that is a artery in the heart that is occluded. We you fixing that in the field? Aggressive. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, but those are the ones, it's pretty rare. But every now and then you'll bring a CPR patient in, especially if it was, you know, little to no downtime. You're doing compressions. You get a heart rate back, um, and they take them up to the cath lab. Those are often the ones that they can save. They'll go in and they'll get that big blood clot out that caused the arrest in the first place. And those are the ones that you'll oftentimes get the best outcome from. All right, so this kind of backs up a little bit to the beginning, so we're going to fly through this. Um, so always, again, begin by doing your certainty, making sure the scene is safe. Remember, we're back to the EMT basic skill sheet kind of days. BSI, scene safe. BSI, scene safe. Make sure you guys drill those in your head for these skills. So scene safety, determine if that patient is truly unresponsive. And then we'll start our principles of BLS. Now, are the numbers the same for adults, infants, and children? Is it 30 to 2 for everybody? No, no. What is it? What is it? 15 to 2. 15 to 2 for who? Two if there's two rescuers. If it's one rescuer, they're all 30 to 2. The infants and children switch to 15 to 2 with two rescuers. Adults stay 30 to 2. And this was kind of a controversy at the last AHA convention when they were going over these numbers. Um, the AHA really, really, really wanted everybody to have the same number. They didn't want any variation. They're trying to simplify it to get more people willing to do CPR. And then the pediatric group really was not comfortable with uh, the 30 to 2. They really wanted 15 to 2 um, because in infants and children, it's much more of a respiratory component than it is a cardiac component most, most of the time. So they really wanted more ventilations. Um, but they finally kind of agreed to disagree and they made it okay if there's two rescuers and you're not having to move and you're not having to reposition and you can do it quickly then we'll let you get off the chest to do your more breathing but if there's one rescuer they decided it was just going to take too long and they stuck with the 30 to 2. Um, that's kind of where the differences came. According to this information uh, what is the age break off between an infant and a child? <clears throat> Thank you. Did you administer D50 before? Um, no, I think I would go. The question was, would you administer D50 before epi? Um, probably not. And the only reason I would say no is most of the time we're ready to administer the epi before we even get a glucose level. Now, because as soon as the IV is in place for a cardiac arrest, we're given the epi right now. And that's when they would be doing the glucose check. Now, I guess, I mean, in a real world, if you had both drugs ready to go at the exact same time and 
I don't know that it would really matter um, if it was if they were truly hypoglycemic because they'd really need both. Um, but I'm going to give either I'm going to give both of them back to back anyway. So I mean, it's a matter of seconds which one do you get first. I still think I would go Epi, um, and the only reason is the Epi is super fast to administer. If you guys watch, I mean, I'm sure all of you will watch D50. How long does it take to push D50? Wow. It takes a while because it's really thick and it takes a while. So I'd get the Epi on board because it's super fast. You can slam it in and then you do your D50. But you guys are going to do D what? Is it D50 or 5 free level? Are you guys D50 as well? Okay. All right, so the age difference before the HA... And for this material is one year. An infant is younger than a year. A child is between a year and puberty. It's not an age. Onset of puberty is a child. All right. Cardiac arrest in adults usually is caused by what? Heart or respiratory? Heart. Cardiac arrest in kids is usually caused by what? Respiratory. Okay. Now, obviously, there are times when that's not the case, um, especially if a kid has a, some congenital heart abnormality that they didn't know about. But if a kid has a normal, healthy heart, it's almost always respiratory. Okay, so then we talked about the another um, important factor besides just compressions is the AED getting there and getting used right away. Um, so early defibrillation is one of the most, you know, most likely things to improve survival rates. When we think about the heart, um, and we're thinking about an AED, what part or what functionality of the heart is the AED working on? It's all electrical, right? Is it doing anything mechanical to your heart whatsoever? Nope, it's just electrical rhythms. So in your heart, where does the heartbeat originate? What part of the heart? The SA node, okay? What is an AED doing for that? Is it, does it start it up? Does it, it actually stops it, right? It gives it a big electrical burst to all the heart muscle, okay? And then all the heart muscle kind of depolarizes all at once and kind of resets all of it. So then we're hoping with that burst stopping all that chaotic electrical impulses that are happening, that just the SA node picks back up its normal pacemaking rhythm and takes over. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, what happens a lot of times though when we defibrillate a patient? It stops the activity, and then what happens? Nothing starts, right? Because the heart is so sick, that SA node doesn't even kick back in. So that, a lot of times we'll go from whatever, VFib or VTAC, whatever it is, to a systole, okay? Which, you know, then we just go down that road. But sometimes it will stop it and then start the heart back up all by itself. But a lot of people think that AED, especially when you talk about lay people, that the AEDs actually start the heart up. So now what the AEDs are doing, they are completely stopping that electrical activity and hoping the heart starts up by itself. What are the two rhythms that an AED will shock? VTAC, VFib. Okay. Now there's a when we talk about VFib, that one's easy because VFib is always pulseless. Is VTAC always pulseless? No. What is the treatment for VTAC with a pulse? Kind of, sometimes. No, but it's VTAC. Um, but it's different. If they're, you only treat it if they're unstable. I've seen people in VTAC for hours before when I worked in the ED. And as long as they were, I mean, they might be having a little chest pain, they might be feeling bad, but as long as their blood pressure was good, those ER doctors could care less that they were in VTAC. I mean, they were concerned, but they weren't really concerned. And they would sit on for hours waiting for a cardiology consult and blood work and this and that. They were not super aggressive like we are in the field. It's like, oh man, VTAC, let's fix it. They would sit on it as long as the patient was stable. Okay, But if they treated it electrically, they don't defibrillate it. What do they do? No. Nope. It's cardioversion. It's still a shock, but it's not defibrillation. And it's a much, much less of amount of um, joules that we're delivering. I mean, it would be like 50 joules, maybe to 100 joules instead of you know, 120 to 200 joules. That's why it is so important if we're talking just AED world, which, you know, in this they're talking about AEDs. What are we really using in our real life? Cardiac monitors, right? They're truly not just an AED. But truly for an AED, that's why it is so important.
important that they don't have a pulse before you even put the AED on. Um, because if it senses VTAC, it can differenti differentiate it, VTAC with a pulse and VTAC without a pulse. What's it going to do? Sure. It's going to defibrillate it. That's not the treatment for VTAC with a pulse. Um, and I know, I have no idea, you know, obviously about your guys' tests, but I know the AHA and a lot of their BLS tests, actually maybe, you know, it's in their ACLS exams, one of their BLS questions would be, okay, you have a patient that was um, pulseless and CPR is going and blah, 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 blah. Oh, no, maybe, a, a, yeah, and the AED has been applied. It says no shock advised, you know, what do you do? And there's always, but where they, do you start a CPR, do you check a pulse? Well, if you have an AED on and it says no shock advised, what is the crux of that question? Do you check a pulse or do you start CPR? What was the rule to put an AED on? You've already checked a pulse. You already know they don't have a pulse. So if, if it's saying do you check a pulse again, you don't. You go right into compressions um, because you don't put an AED on if they have a pulse. All it's saying is that it's not VTAC or VFib. Right, that's all it's telling you. And if it's V, it, right, because it can't sense a pulse. It's not, it's just sensing electrical activity. So just realize that in, when you're talking about an AED, and we talk, it doesn't really matter for VFib because the treatment's exactly the same, but VTAC, it's different, and so you need to know what you're treating. But in our world, what if we're throwing them on a cardiac monitor, you're always going to have a medic there. They're going to look at it and say, oh, yeah, it's you know, whatever it is. You're going to feel a pulse. So it's a little bit different than the AED. But just remember, when you're thinking about AED, AED questions on a test with the National Registry, assume you don't have a medic there, because that's how they're going to word these questions. Like, you're the one leading the show. Um, so if it's an AED, make sure that it was pulseless before you put it on. All right. So in that, it's looking for VFib and VTAC. What is VFib? What's happening in the heart? Or what, okay, what, let, me make, let me make it more simple. What part of the heart is being affected? The ventricles, okay. Um, it's ventricular fibrillation. So the ventricles are fibrillating. What does fibrillating mean? They're just quivering, okay. So what's causing, why are they just quivering? Why, what causes that? Okay, so the cardiac muscle is pretty amazing. Every part of your heart can become the pacemaker of the heart. It's made where if the top part of your heart, the pacemaker fails, something else will kick in and become the pacemaker. Something else can, you know, it'll just keep working itself down the heart. So every piece of the heart does have the ability to, to say, hey, I'm going to be the pacemaker now because I'm not getting an impulse from somebody else. I'm going to make my own impulse. Every now and then, though, due to certain conditions or, you know, it could be like hypoxia from an MI, it could be from an overdose, it could just be from you know, heart failure. Lots of things can cause it. But all of a sudden, the heart isn't perfusing like it should, and all these cardiac muscles are saying, man, man, I'm not getting the electrical impulse I need. All right, I'm going to become a pacemaker. And a whole bunch of them will start all over the ventricles being their own little pacemakers. Well, what is that going to do when you try to have them all work together to compress the heart muscle when they're all beating at different rates now, all the little cardiac cells? So the heart is just truly quivering because so many places are triggering electrical impulses all over. That's really what VFib is. That's why you need to stop it with an AED. Um, okay, what about ventricular tachycardia? What, how is that different? Is it all beating in an unorganized fibrillating pattern? No. What does tachycardia mean? We're beating fast, so the ventricles are just too fast, okay? So fast that the heart chambers aren't having a chance to fill up with blood. So it's pumping, but it's not pumping anything because the blood just can't fill up in the cha chambers as fast as it's pumping. So it'd be like a, you know, a fire engine pump cavitating with no water. I mean, that's kind of what the heart muscle is doing with ventricular tachycardia. It's just going crazy and not pumping any fluid, not pumping any blood. So again, we need to reset that and try to get it to slow down. Do um, you guys know what the ventricular rate is most of the time with VTAC? More like 240 to 260 beats a minute. I mean, it's, it's beating really fast. All right, questions on that? All right, so for an adult patient, we're using adult 
pads, right? It's pretty simple. Can you use adult pads on a kid? If you have to, that's the key. They want you to use adult pads for adults, pediatric pads for peds, infants for infants. Unless you don't have the right pad and you have to use the other one, then you can. They used to say you couldn't even use adult pads on kids, period. Now it's like, well, it's better than nothing. Um, but if you're going to use an adult pad on a child or infant, what do you have to make sure doesn't happen with pad placement? The pads can't touch each other. And why is that? And the electrical impulse can actually just travel. Because the impulse is going away from one pad to the other. They're both sending and receiving. If they're touching, it's going to take the path of least resistance. So it's just going to go right through the pads. And it's going to skip going through the patient. Um, so that's really why they don't want them to touch, because they you're not benefiting the patient. Then. You're just shocking the pads to themselves. Um, what Now, do you need to change the settings on a defibrillator or an AED to shock a patient? No, because what happens? It's like for adults and children, how does it know the difference? It's actually the pads have that attenuators, what do they call it, where it reduces it. Did you have a question? Yeah, for the placements of that, if you have to use the adult, you do front-back then? It would be much easier to do front-back. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so on an AED, you don't have to... Um, it depends who you talk to. Um, a lot of people do front-back all the time. There's some literature that says it's better, but as far as this information, it's you have still have a choice. I prefer front to back, but sometimes just depending how big your patient is, it's harder to get front and back. Um, but I like front and back better. Why is that? Keeps, keeps it out of the way, and I also think it's just you're sandwiching the heart better. You're not going through as much tissue, especially if you're talking to somebody big. There tends to be less, less tissue this way sandwiching their heart than it is going across their whole body. Um, but that's my only reason. I don't have any clinical data to back it up or anything like that, just preference. All right, and they do say for infants, they prefer manual defibrillators over AEDs. Um, really, in almost any case, I think a manual where you can really see exactly what you're treating would be better than an AED. But for this specifically, just in case of the question that pops up, for infants specifically, they prefer the manuals over an AED. All right, what if you have a patient that has an implanted pacemaker? Yeah. Why? Yeah, I don't care about frying the pacemaker because you're going to fry it anyway. If you defibrillate them, even if you're not right over top of the pacemaker, you're probably going to disrupt their pacemaker. It's because we don't want to stop the, we don't want that to impede the electrical impulse through the chest. That's why. They don't, want, they don't want the pad to be over that big pacemaker and have the electricity hit the pacemaker and not travel through to the heart. It really is all the, the only reason why. Same thing, any kind of port or anything in their chest, stick away from it if you know it's there. Typically, where are, um, pay, pay, space, where are pacemakers implanted in the chest? Upper left. Upper left. Where do we put our pads? Right. right. So usually it's not an issue. But every now and then you will have something on the right. Um, also, what if they have a like a transdermal medication patch there? Just remove it. Yeah, wipe it. remove it, wipe it off. Same reason. We just don't want that to impede the the energy going delivering through the chest. All right. What about a patient that was pulled out of a swimming pool and they're all wet? Can you shock them? Yes, but what should you do first? Dry them off as best you can. Do you have to have every single little droplet of water off of them? No, you just want as much as you can quickly. Because if their chest is completely wet and we go to defibrillate them, what do we not want that electricity to do? We don't want it to just to travel up through the water and go from one pad to the other. Again, we want it to travel through the tissue, and it's going to take its path of least resistance. So that's why we do that. All right, what about the... The old guy with a huge hairy chest. What does this book tell you to do? What does your book tell you to do? They, what do they tell you is the most effective way to remove that? Put a pair of pads on and rip them off. Put a new pair of pads on. Effective? Absolutely. 
expensive? Very much so compared to a razor. All right. Um, what is what do a pair of pads cost? Last I knew, about sixty bucks for a set of pads. I bet the the one I don't know what the ones with the puck are, the CPR ones. I bet they were more than sixty. Um, what's a razor cost? A few cents. So, in our world, if it, this isn't quite as critical, other than when we talk about cost effectiveness, um, if you had to use the pads to rip off somebody's hair, use the pads to rip off somebody's hair. Um, where this is important, though, is if you're out, let's say you're out in the community or you're at a school and you happen to be there and some kid goes into cardiac arrest or some teacher and they bring you an AED and you, the, whoever it happened to be happened to have a hairy chest, more than likely what's going to be in that AED? One pair of adult pads, one pair of beads pads. Why aren't they going to carry a bunch of pads? It's expensive and they expire, right? Why are they... In, the likelihood is that AED has never even been used. So those places don't carry multiple set of pads. So just make sure before you stick a pair of adult pads on some guy with a super hairy chest that you know you have another set of adult pads to use if it doesn't stick. Um, otherwise, you're screwed at that point. So what could you do, though, if you had that one AED with a set of adult and a set of beads pads? Use the peds pads first to try to rip off as much hair as you can. At least then you have a chance for the adult pads to stick. Now, if they have a razor in the AED, great. Do a quick shave job. But otherwise, um, your pads are your options. All right. Do we need to talk about positioning for CPR? I sure hope not. All right. So we're checking for breathing. Again, you look, listening, feel for breathing. Checking for the pulse. Where are you checking for a pulse on an adult? Carotid, peds. Um, if for moral is actually a great place to do it for any age group, but they'll they'll teach you. Um, and then or actually, and then the infants is what I threw you off with peds. Infant, where you check? That's the um, brachial. And where is the brachial? Right on their arm. Man, it is super easy to feel on those little kids. You just you just, just squeeze their arm, and if they have a pulse, you're going to feel it. It's not hard to find. All right, hand placement for cardiac arrest. This is actually important, and I think for the most part, all of you guys probably do a good job. If you watch the community members, they struggle on this. But um, Hand placement and hand position. First of all, what part of your hand are you using for compressions? Palm. Why? Why does it make any difference? Yeah, but actually the most important reason, it is a direct line with the bones in your arm, okay? You're not relying on any of these weak finger bones or muscles. It is that you are using, and it's a direct, direct line up into your whole arm or shoulder, okay? So when you push down, you're going to get the most bang for your buck rather than trying to use your, your hands, which is, are not near as effective, even though every now and then you'll see somebody try to do it. So use your arm. So you're going to get the best compression and you're going to get the least amount of fatigue for you, okay? Um, what, what muscle group are you using to do the best compressions? Are it your arms at all? Nope. What is it? It's, it's your, really your, it's your body weight more than muscles, but mostly it's more muscles in your back that you use, but it's mostly your body weight that you're using for compressions. So your back muscles are going to be lifting up, but when you press down, it's mostly just your body weight you're shoving into the patient. What about it, um, kids, though? Are they different with how you position your hands? What's the only difference in a peds from an adult? It depends on the side of the pediatric kid. Because there, believe me, there's some, there's some 16-year-old kids or 14-year-old kids that are twice my size, right? Am I going to treat them like an adult? Absolutely. But if it's a small kid and you've got big hands, you can go to one hand if you feel like that's good enough. Okay. What about infants? How are they different? There's two methods for an infant. You can do the encircling hands technique where you're wrapping it around. Um, now, with that, I often hear people say you're using your thumbs. And you kind of are, but not really. 
It's not this where you're squeezing with your thumbs. That is not the motion. It's this. Okay. You are squeezing their back and their chest. So it's not truly your thumbs doing the compression. You are squeezing their chest. Think of it almost like the um, belt that Zoll has for cardiac arrest where it just squeezes their whole chest down. That's what you're doing with infant CPR. You're just squeezing their chest. But use the, your fingers in the back as well to pull up on the back and squeeze the chest. Is there any infant that you shouldn't be using that technique on? If they're too big for you to really reach around and you're doing it out here, then you're not getting a good squeeze in their chest. Don't do that. If you can't reach around them, it's the two fingers um, technique instead. Okay? All right. Once the patient gets a pulse back, in our world, do we always put them in the recovery position? No, where are we putting them? We're watching them for a little bit. We're getting ready to transport. We're getting other things done. If we haven't done it yet, maybe throwing in an advanced airway, whatever. But we're getting ready to put them on the gurney. Do we really ever put anybody in the recovery position on the gurney unless they're actively vomiting? Not really. So, But this is talking about you are a BLS provider in what setting? Wherever. There are not... This is truly going off the AHA guidelines, okay? Which does not assume you're in an ambulance, working on an ambulance, in a hospital, in anywhere. You're out in the streets. So all this stuff, think about what am I going to do as a person doing, working a full arrest, but don't necessarily always think like, oh, they assume I'm an EMT. So at this point, it's like, okay, they have a pulse back. Now what do you do? You put them in the recovery position and you're waiting for help to arrive. So that's where you kind of think you need to think about this. All right, ventilations. We talked about the fact that we have a tendency to breathe too fast for our patients. That across the board, healthcare providers breathe too fast for the patients. Too fast, too fast, too fast, too fast, too fast. You've got to slow down. Now, I've heard people say one good method to kind of control this is if you take a breath, give the patient a breath. But what are we typically doing on a really sick patient, especially if we're relatively new or we're breathing fast too, right? And, um, so don't go off that. Go off counting. How often do you give a breath? About every six seconds. And if you're not sure if it's really been a full six seconds, wait a couple more. I would rather have you breathe too slow than too fast. Because when you're ventilating with a bag valve mask, what percentage of oxygen are you giving them? 100%. Way more than they're normally breathing in the normal air anyway. I would rather have you slow, 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 slow down than breathe too fast. Now, we have another tool, though, that can help us determine our respiratory rate. And that, it's not as effective on a cardiac arrest. But let's say we're just ventilating a patient that's not in cardiac arrest. What tool can you use to help control your rate? End tidal carbon dioxide. Then we're breathing to keep the end tidal CO2 numbers in that normal range, not counting rates, which is even more effective. But for cardiac arrest, please, 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 slow down your breathing rates. And don't forcefully blow that air in. Now, it gets a little bit trickier, though, because if you forcefully ventilate them, what happens to the air sometimes, or a lot of times? It goes into the stomach, right? goes both into the lungs and the stomach but it's a patient that man we're breathing fast we're breathing hard we're shoving that oxygen in there and you're just watching their belly get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and pretty soon what's going to happen that pressure is going to get too much and it's going to come back out along with a bunch of food and everything else um just hope your face isn't down there you're the patient but now you've just put the patient at huge risk for what aspiration okay um so yeah don't forcefully blow that oxygen in. With high performance CPR though, that gets a little bit tricky. Why? Because we're not stopping the compression to, to push it in. So we are forcefully blowing it in a little more than we would like to see it, but just really watch. If you're doing CPR and you're, you know, you're doing the high performance and you're every, you know, 10th compression, you're forcing that air in and you see that they're getting gastric distension, in your mind, what are you thinking we need to be doing? 
If you haven't done it yet, we need to be secure in the airway. Um, so what is the best way to secure an airway on a patient? The best way to prevent them from getting anything in their, in their throat from aspirating is an ET tube because it truly blocks off the trachea. Okay, what about putting an eye gel in? Is it going to help? It'll, it's better than nothing. So if you don't have a medic there, put in an eye gel if they're getting a gastric distension for sure. Um, it's better than nothing. But if they forcefully vomit, it will push the eye gel out and they can still aspirate. That's why if you actually look at the literature, things like LMAs, eye gels, king tubes, all the supraglottic airways, they truly will say that the patient needs to be NPO. Do you guys know what that means, NPO? It's a medical, I don't even know what it stands for, but it's a medical abbreviation for somebody that hasn't had anything to eat or drink for six hours. Okay, that's what those, those devices were truly designed for. They were designed for patients going into an operating room setting for a controlled procedure, a scheduled procedure, where they were told, don't eat or drink anything for six hours before this. They come in, their stomach is empty. They can put in these airway devices that don't have to go through the vocal cords and cause the trauma there. They're great in that setting. Well, they've, those devices have been transitioned into the field in the EMS, but our patients aren't NPO. You have no idea when they last ate or drank, and I guarantee you it probably wasn't six hours ago. Um, so they all have a risk of aspiration. They do not occlude the airway. Um, but just be aware of that and be careful when you ventilate that we're not causing a bunch of gastric distension. Now, what can we do if you have uh, ALS provider on scene? Let's say you don't have an ET tube in, but what else can they do to help prevent gas the, that gastric distension? They can throw in a, a like an you know NG or an OG tube, basically a tube that goes into their stomach that you can hook up to suction that evacuates. What are we really wanting to evacuate out of there? Yeah, we're not. I don't care about the food or anything. I'm not trying to empty their stomach. I just want the air out of there that to relieve the pressure. So if the pressure goes down, the likelihood of them vomiting also goes down. All right. Ob obviously, remember, always use a barrier device when administering any kind of ventilations to a person in a pre-hospital environment. Um, again, the AHA, one single provider, they like the mouth to mask. Just keep that in mind. Although in real life, what we go to is a BVM, but one provider, they prefer the mouth to mask. All right, and we... Just talked about hyperventilating, so I'll skip over that. All right, you have a patient with a stoma. What are you going to do to ventilate them? I hear people talking about uh, Nobody's loud enough where I can hear what you said. Let the new guy do it. New guys, perfect. Mouth to mask or mouth to mouth over the stoma. Mouth to stoma. Mm, yeah. Okay, now we'll, so we'll put a mask over it. What kind of mask? Uh, Peds are infant, depending on what you have and how big their neck is and how big the stoma is. And, but a small little mask that will seal right over it, okay? Um, all of the masks, the tubes on the top of the mask, they're all the same size. So they're all going to hook up to the same you know, BVM, just like normal. So, And you're going to be able to get the amount of volume need, you need through it the same way because the whole size is the same. The only thing that's different is how it seals to the face. So even for an, an adult, you're getting plenty of volume through an infant mask and it just allows you to seal it up in their neck better. Now, you stick this mask on their neck, and you start ventilating. What do you want to know right away? That the air is going where? Okay. What if it's also blowing out of their mouth and their nose? And it could, depending on how it was in the patient. Then you have to make sure you occlude their mouth and nose. So someone has to be occluding that. It's probably going to take two of you. Somebody to occlude that and somebody else to ventilate. And it completely depends surgically how they did it and what's, what the place in their stoma is, how it's connected. Every now and then it's just a hole in the trachea, but everything else is still open. Um, now, if it's a permanent long-term thing and they're going to be on this for an extended period of time, then oftentimes it's not net connected to the mouth anymore. But you don't know that when we get there. So just make sure that if we're ventilating and you're not getting chest dries, and it doesn't seem to be working, make sure you're not blowing out of their mouth and nose.
Okay, so again, so we'll t this is just talking about one rescue or CPR. It kind of cuts, it kind of goes in and out of the same cycle. So we talked about 30 to 2 already. You're going to just keep 30 to 2 compressions for how many cycles before you check for a pulse again? Five. Okay, two rescue or CPR is preferred over one. Why is that? Really obvious, but why is that? Fatigue is the number one thing. Uh, so you guys can take turns, you know, not burning your muscles out and your back out. And it also just doesn't take as long to switch between compression to breast, compression to breast. It's much quicker when you don't have to physically move. The second rescuer can have the airway device ready to breathe. The minute you're done with the compression, they can give the breath. If you're doing it by yourself, you get down with the compression, you move up, you put the mask on. It just takes longer. It's much, much more efficient with two people or more. All right, you guys got all that. We talked about that. All right. Um, I had actually never even seen this PACE mnemonic until I was preparing for this lecture for you guys. Um, I don't know if this is an AHA thing or if this is from the NREMT. I'm not even sure where it comes from, but it just looks like a really test question to me. I don't know if it's on your. I don't. I don't think it's on your test. I have no idea. But this just looks like something I could see. It would be a real easy question. So even though I hate to have you guys memorize, you know, dumb trivia stuff, this one probably isn't a bad thing to at least have an idea what it is. But pace is probe, and what it says is look or ask to confirm the problem. Alert is to communicate the problem to the team leader. Challenge, if there is an issue that is not corrected, challenge the team's present course of action. So if you think something's going wrong and you let them know and you're not sure, it's like, you know, speak up. And then emergency, um, if the problem is clear and critical, immediately communicate the emergency to the entire team. Um, now, I know why they have sayings like this, even though I haven't seen this exact one. There has been lots and lots and lots of um, cases where they've gone back after critical events have occurred in both pre-hospital and in the hospital setting, but it was it's more often the hospital setting where really bad outcomes came from patients that shouldn't have had bad outcomes. And they went back and they studied it and they will talk to people and interview them. It's like, well, I knew it was going bad or I knew we should have done this or I thought we should have done this, but they don't say anything. Why do you think they didn't say anything? Not their place. It's not their place. Whose place is it? The doctor's job. He's running the code, okay? And in our field, what could we kind of, what could you guys say? Well, the medic was running the code. The medic was doing it. It was his call. He's the guy on scene. Okay. Even though you felt like, man, this isn't going how I think it should go. You need to speak up. And things like this are telling you, speak up, speak up, speak up, speak up. Um, because it's, it can, yeah, it can be really, really bad. And I had one kind of example of how this, I was on a case like this in the emergency department one time. We had a little, I think it was a little two-year-old that got brought in POV from Worley. It was kind of a bad case. This kid got ran over by a riding lawnmower. And instead of calling 911, they threw the kid in the car and just drove him to the hospital. The kid gets there. I mean, she is as white as a ghost. Her One of her entire legs was basically missing. There was some tissue left, but it was pretty much just gone. She was bleeding out. Um, could not get an IV in this kid to save her life. Could not get an IV. And... Then they did an IO in the opposite leg that immediately infiltrated and didn't work or wouldn't work, came out, or I don't remember what it was. But So we didn't have IV access, couldn't get IVs. And we're filling around. The kid goes into cardiac arrest while we're trying to fix all this. So we're doing CPR on this this little kiddo. Still, for, we coded this kid for uh, like an hour. We never did get vascular access in this kid in an hour when they find them like, okay, we got to stop. When we got thinking about it afterwards, it's like, well, what else could have we done for IV access? We're in the hospital. We're not in the field. Okay. There's lots of other. We, well, they had tried sites all over. We weren't just trying the arms. Well, one thing we uh, talked about was even IO access. Well, where did we try the IO? The leg. Where else can you do IOs? All over, especially in a little two-year-old where you have easy access to them. And all of us got talking about afterwards, why didn't we try it anywhere else? You're not trained on it. Where do you train on an IO every single time you do a training? What is the mannequin device? It's a leg. 
So we actually went after that call and we looked to try to find an IO trainer that was not a leg. And at that point, you could not find it. There was not an IO trainer that was not a leg. Well, how do you expect people in the, in the heat of a moment in a true emergency to try something they've never practiced on? Even though they've been told, oh yeah, you can do it there. But if you've never even done it on a mannequin, are you gonna think to do it on a victim? Maybe not. But we're kind of getting this back to this. Even though during that time, there were people in that code thinking, man, we should probably do it, trying something else. Maybe we should, there was some people that said, I even thought about trying to put an IO somewhere else. They didn't say anything or they didn't bring it up to the team or they didn't make a suggestion. So this is saying, this is empowering you guys in the middle of an emergency when things are not going well. Please, 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 please speak up. And a lot of this actually also comes from the airline industry where they've had, that's really where they've studied a lot of this, where people haven't spoken up, where they've had air traffic crashes or near crashes where team members on the, the crew knew something was wrong and did not speak up. All right. So important thing with resource management, just know your roles. Um, each member needs to know their roles, but also be empowered to kind of speak on behalf of the team if they need to. And I'm not going to go over all those. All right. Post resuscitation support. Um, so when, if we get return of spontaneous circulation, so we get ROS, gets the code over. No, but actually that's when it gets, becomes the most critical. Because before, what'd you have? You had a dead body. Now you don't. Now they're alive. And now you need to keep them alive, or hopefully. So this is where actually the real work in the, the begins. But what do we always need to be prepared for during ROSC? Immediate return to a cardiac arrest, because oftentimes they'll re-arrest. Rearrest multiple times, even if they survive, they frequently rearrest, rearrest. So when you get pulses back, don't forget to frequently be checking for pulses. Because what usually doesn't happen with the victim, what usually doesn't come back right away, even if, yeah, consciousness. So they're going to remain unconscious. And oftentimes they don't even start breathing on their own right away. So we're still going to be ventilating for them. So you're going to have an unconscious victim that we're breathing for them. And it's like, oh yeah, they had a pulse. Well, how long ago did you check it? We need to be checking that all the time. Now, what are we gonna have that'll give us a clue to circulation though? Our monitor, don't go off the rhythm though, because they could have a rhythm on the monitor and still no pulse, correct? What's that called? PEA, pulse electric activity. The, actually, the best indicator though on our monitor would if we had, really if we had the end title um, CO2 hooked up to give our real-time CO2 data because if their carbon dioxide levels all of a sudden just dump off What do you assume? They're not circulating anymore so that carbon dioxide isn't getting expelled because it's not there's no circulation happening So that is your best real-time indicator other than feel, feeling for a pulse that something changed And it does say um, leave AED pads in place Kind of the same thing. Leave all your stuff there. I mean, we don't ever get in the habit of ripping everything off just because we get pulses back. Because again, frequently you're going to, or you could have to shock them again. All right, what are you going to do for oxygenation post cardiac arrest? Okay. And they're going to maintain their tube with the If Most of the time they're going to keep their, their tube in place. Um, this, this can get a little bit tricky if you're way out of town. If you have a post-cardiac arrest patient that starts bucking the tube, do you, do you sedate them or do you pull the tube? That's a, it's a scary one either way because I hate giving a bunch of sedation meds to a patient that just was in cardiac arrest. I hate giving them any medications that I don't have to give them. Um, but then I hate losing my airway too. Um, if I had a superglottic airway, I'd probably pull it. If I had an ET tube, I'd probably sedate them. Um, but just make sure we keep them oxygenized. Hypotension, post cardiac arrest. What would you guess that their blood pressure is going to be just after cardiac arrest? Normal, high, or low? Low. Low. I'm okay tolerating some low blood low blood pressure post cardiac arrest. For one thing, I don't want a high for sure, so I don't want to fluid overload them, because what is that causing the heart to have to do? 
work harder, right? Because now they have more afterload that they're pushing against that back pressure. It's going to make the heart work harder. If it's already struggling, I don't want to make it work harder. So I'm okay with some hypotension. When I mean some, what do you think my threshold is or my, well, how low would you think I'd go with systolic pressure before I gave fluids? Yeah, 85 to 90. If it was lower than that, I'm giving fluids. I'm okay with a low blood pressure for a little while after cardiac arrest. Now, if it's been 10 minutes and their pressure's not coming up, then I'll start giving some fluids. Uh, but your first couple pres pressures right after cardiac arrest, if it's a little low, that's okay. Um, but don't, don't let them stay hypotensive for a long amount of time. But let them recover a little bit before all of a sudden we just throw in a bunch of fluids at them. Yes, and, and a fluid bolus for me on this, for an adult patient, um, well, uh, let me ask you, if you're talking fluid bolus, how much fluid are you giving the patient? What are you thinking of fluid bolus? Yeah, 250 to 500 is the kind of standard fluid bolus. So um, for us, and you know, it depends on where you are. I mean, most of the guys in Coeur d'Alene, I mean, unless you have a really big IV flowing really good, you're not going to get 250 in by the time we get to the hospital. So a fluid bolus to us is going to be wide open until we get them there. But for those of you guys that have a little longer transport time, you'll have to watch that because you can get them, you can easily get, I mean, maybe a liter in if they have a really good IV by the time you guys get to the hospital. So it just depends when you started the fluids and how far away you are. But yeah, 250 to 500. Consider the treatable causes, the HNTs that we talked about in the beginning, and then advanced critical care stuff. Okay. Then it talks a little bit about um, some of the advanced devices. So active compression decompression CPR. Um, that is this device here, this blue thing stuck on the chest. How many of you guys ever get to see one of these? Um, they actually are pretty cool. I got to go to a Zoll booth at one of the conferences I went to where they actually had a cadaver that we were using this thing on. And it truly does like suction cup to their chest. And the cool thing about it is, when you're doing CPR, not only are you know you press down in the chest in normal CPR, but the recoil phase, how is that occurring? Just naturally with the chest coming up, right? This device actually pulls the chest back up with it, and so it forcefully, you know, wants to suck in air and stuff with the victim. And it also, when you look at the um, on this particular this cadaver, they had um, different um, sensors all over the patient's body and their di um, different blood vessels. And when they used th this device compared to just normal compression, the circulatory system was much more efficient with CPR with how it varied those pressures and helped the circulate the blood. So it was actually really amazing. It, um, Chris Way was actually with us in the booth. I was surprised he didn't come right back out and buy them. So I'm assuming they're pretty expensive. Um, because he was he was pretty impressed with them as well. And then the impedance threshold device, do you guys know where that gets attached to? It gets yeah attached into the, to, to the um, BVM between the ET tube and the BVM. It limits air entering the lungs during the recoil phase between the chest compressions, which helps improve circulation during CPR. Um, I have not got a chance to see one of those or play with those. All right, then we have our mechanical CPR devices. The mechanical piston device is the one on your left there, the kind of the turquoise one, or the, um, the green, green one, and then the blue one is the load distributing band. Any benefit or um, negative impact on either one of these devices, one versus the other? Yeah, not really. Um, the data isn't really clear that one works better than the other. The data also isn't clear with whether these truly improve survivability. Um, but what does it help? It helps fatigue, for sure. It helps us deliver more consistent compressions on a long-term basis. So if anytime you had a lengthy transport time or a lengthy code, these would be, in my opinion, way better than um, just mechanical CPR. But at the same time, they are expensive and the studies kind of vary on how effective they are. They all have proven to work, but they're not, they haven't necessarily proven to be statistically that much better than physical hands-on CPR. 
So it makes it a little bit harder for agencies to decide to spend the money on them when there's no proven benefit. Um, but if you had an agency where you had significant long transport times, and especially if you were a BLS system, um, where you didn't have medics who could call the codes and you had to transport every code, that would be very beneficial. Um, we have talked multiple times about getting those here. Are they out for another grant? Did we get that grant? Or? Yeah, uh, we're gonna be applying for eight of them under the uh, Idaho State EMS grant which is open now, closes on April 1st. Okay. So we're going to do eight, and they'll go to the BLS transport agencies and the BCs at the ALS transport. Cool. So at least then, yeah, then you'll have the, even for our agencies that won't have them on all the ambulances, if you end up with that patient that you know you're going to be transporting and your BC arrives, then you can throw it on them before you transport. And even if this would be a great device to put on a patient, that you have ROSC before you transport. Because where's the worst place to be doing CPR? Back of an ambulance. What is likely or statistically likely to happen during transport of a patient that would just arrested? Rearrest. If you already have it on them, great. Even if you don't, if you had like the band restricting one, you didn't have the strap on them, but you had the board behind them and they're ready to go, that would be the way to do it. All right, kids, we already talked about the fact that resp or cardiac arrest in children is typically respiratory in nature. So focus, 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 focus on airway and breathing on the kids. Make sure you have airway and breathing um, when you're talking about CPR. And we don't really talk about it in this lecture because it's a whole different thing and they don't get into it. But when we talk about neonatal resuscitation, what is it? That is where even more so where it's more airway breathing, airway breathing, airway breathing. They could have a patient with really hypotensive and they don't even worry about cardiac at all until they've done, you know, just dealt with just breathing for 30 seconds to a minute. All right, so it says never shake a child to determine unresponsiveness. Um, anybody know why that is? Maybe I have no idea to be honest with you. Um, yeah, it looks bad. I mean, this kind of shaking looks really bad. But, I mean, I mean, if you're just generally stimulated, I don't see what, where it would make a difference. But yeah, specifically says don't sh shake the children. Um, unresponsive apneic pulse of kids. Perform your CPR again, thirty to two if you're by yourself. And now what they're talking about here? Okay, perform CPR for five cycles and then call nine one one. When do you call 911 for an adult? Do you start CPR or do you call 911 first? 911 first. 911 first, why? Specifically, you want to get the AED coming. That's true too. But yeah, for adults, you really want, the, you want AED on both of them, but it's higher priority for an adult because it's more likely cardiac. In kids, it's more likely respiratory. So let's take the time right now and try to fix the respiratory component immediately with doing so, um, your, five, your five rounds of CPR. Now, if they're small enough that you can take them with you and do CPR and go to a phone, that's best. But if you have to choose compressions or phone, adults, phone, kids, CPR. Okay. Yeah, have you taken a break yet? Nope. I think we're just about I done. Just wanted we only have one bathroom during this little issue we're having with our bathrooms. I can open the door going into the old part, and there's a bathroom in there, too. So I'll unlock it so you can go both ways. Just so you know. Oh, shoot. That's not what I wanted. Sorry, I had to reset the mine to the beginning. Um. Okay, some of this we're going to breeze through because I have talked about it a lot already. All right, um, for body obstructions, we're going to talk quickly about this because, again, you guys have done this and know this. Um, for uh, child or infant, how are you relieving a foreign body obstruction? Okay, that would be... Um, actually, they're both, is that just infant? Yeah, because child and adult are the same. That's infant. 
I kind of threw you off with my question, but yes. So a, it depends on if they're conscious or not conscious. All of them, if they're conscious and making some noise or they're coughing, what do you do? Nothing. Support them and be ready, right? Okay. So now we'll say adult and children, adult and child. Now they're still conscious, but they have a complete obstruction. No airway noise. Nothing's going on. So that's Heimlich, okay, or the abdominal thrust. How long are you doing those for, or how many uh, thrusts? Do, they, do you relieve the object, or do they pass out, go unconscious, okay? Once they go unconscious, what are you doing? Laying them down and going right into compressions. Don't look at the airway. Don't look for the object. Don't try to do a breath. Go right into compressions. After your first round of compressions, though, then you go up and look for the object in the airway. Try the breath. If it doesn't go, reposition. Try the breath um, again. And if it doesn't go, just go back into compressions. Okay. But that first time after they go into responsive, right onto the chest for compressions. Okay. Infants. So you're holding in the little infant. They were conscious. They're fully obstructed. Now they go limp in your arms. Face down, butt higher than their head, head lower than the butt, however you want to put it. Five back blows, okay? Flip them over, five chest thrusts. And most of the time, I, I love teaching this in CPR because you see the people like, oh. It's like, no, smack the kid, right? They're not breathing. But I think in real life, if you really had a kid not breathing, I don't think you would have a hard time really trying to dislodge it. But really hit it. But support their head and neck. Make sure that, because you, if you're hitting them pretty good to relieve the object, make sure you have a good hold of the head and neck um, because you don't want to cause any kind of you know, head, or, head trauma or spinal trauma. How long do you do those for? Oh, actually, that was, um, that, so that was, they're obstructed, they're not breathing, but they were still conscious. Now they go unconscious, what do you do? Now it's just CPR, just like the adults, except with, with the child or the infant methods. All right, when do you not start CPR? Obvious death, right? Now, um, so they talk about rigor mortis and lividity as being signs of, sorry, I'm trying to catch up where I am here because I reset my didn't normal, as obvious death. For you, when you see somebody with, you know, lividity or rigor mortis, any idea how long they've been down? You're talking minutes, hours, days. What are we thinking? Yeah, after like 24 to 48 hours, it'll go away. Mm -hmm. So dependent lividity, it starts right away inside the body, but it's usually not visible for about two hours. So once you see it, it'll start becoming visible in two hours. Now, the funny thing about that is even though you'll start seeing it in two hours, if we move the patient, it will move, okay, it, up to about like the four to six hours. Once it's been that long, it'll set in, and you, it won't change it. But if we have somebody that's, you know, just barely starting to see the lividity and we roll the patient over, then we're like when the coroner does their evaluation, the lividity will be different because that blood will still pool at the um, other places. So just keep that in mind. Well, it's not going to prevent us from moving our patients, but they might want it. it Any time you see this, I think all of us as a general rule need to get better at documenting this, especially if you have a patient that you had dependent lividity and you didn't realize it was that new onset. And let's say they were on their side and you saw it, you know, on their left side. Well, then we roll them on their back and we're doing CPR or whatever and the call it, or we're not doing CPR or whatever. We move them we, and then... You get called into court, and the coroner's like, well, the lividity was on the back, and you saw it on their side, but if you didn't document it, it could just make things messy for you. Um, but I just get really clear about documenting when things happen. What about rigor mortis? How long until it sets in? Four to six hours. Okay. Now, um, I have some recent... <sighs> I had a recent um, court case where I was called into court for this, and 
I guess this has made me even more. I, I document my cardiac arrest a little more thoroughly now after this. My codes. Um, I was actually called. It was called to a grand jury, not to a normal case, because they were trying to decide if they had enough information to charge this family with um, the murder of their child or manslaughter or whatever it would be. The it was found out in the autopsy that the child died of starvation. Um, and so that's what that, you know, it was from, you know, pretty rough family, lots of drugs and stuff. And so, but what, the reason I got called in, in my documentation, I documented that we got there, we initially started CPR on this infant. Mom was doing CPR on the infant when we got there. We immediately took over and we started CPR. Um, the person that was doing the airway is like, man, I'm having a hard time getting the jaw open on a little baby. So then what did I need? It went in my mind right away. So, oh man, I hope, it, I hope it's not rigor. And the kid was this white, I mean, white, 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 not blue, just white, but warm, warm to the touch. And so it was weird that they were warm and yet possible rigor. So I went up real quick and yeah, sure enough, the jaw felt rigor. So I'm like, okay, let's stop and let's turn the, the kid over. And we rolled him over and it was obvious lividity. It's like, so what do we do at that point? We're done, right? Um, so I, that's what I document in report. The child was warm with lividity and rigor mortis. So then I get called in. And if you guys have ever, ever been to a, um, a grand jury, it's a little bit different. Um, because anybody can ask you questions. All the jurors can ask you questions as well as the lawyers that are there and the judge. So I'm getting all these questions from all these people. But there was lots and lots and lots of questions. So it's like, well, how could the... You know, they asked me, you know, how long does it take for, you know, rigor mortis to set in and lividity to set in. And luckily, um, I had a chance to kind of look that up before I went because I didn't know it off the top of my head at that point. Um, but the lawyer's like, they're going to ask you these. So make sure you have an answer for that. Um, and then they're like, well, then how could the baby have still been warm if they were dead for that long? What was wrong in your assessment? Or how did you mess that up? Well, how could a baby be warm and be dead for four to six hours? A warm environment. Okay. So then, like, well, where did you find the baby? On the floor with mom doing CPR. Well, what was he dressed in? Diaper. And so they're like, well, how was the baby warm? What was my answer? I don't know. I don't know what position the baby was in when mom found it in cardiac arrest. I know she said that she found the baby... It was taking a nap. She went to check in the baby and found that it was unconscious. Started CPR. I'm like, I didn't go in the bedroom and look and see where the baby was. Um, but law enforcement had, I guess the baby was, didn't even have a crib or anything. They, he slept in a car seat in the room. I don't remember if it was a he or she, um, but the baby slept in a car seat and had been covered up with a lot of blankets. And so, I mean, and the room was technically warm. But just as, you know, food for thought when we talk about, it's pretty obvious when not to start resuscitation. But just do a really good job of documenting. So in cases like my case where at the end of that cardio, I'll be honest with you, other than the fact that the baby looks small, I just figured it was SIDS. I didn't figure that was anything unusual. It was from a poor home, poor environment. But there was nothing obvious on the baby that shouted out to me, man, this is going to go to court. The patient, you know, parents are going to get charged for this or whatever. Um, so just uh, keep that in mind because even cases you don't expect, you could end up in court. And on this particular case, the grand jury did decide that there was enough evidence to charge the family with the child's death, and the, ch the family pled guilty, so there was no court. They, I didn't have to go back to court. Okay, what about a DNR order? What has to be in place? If you're going to not do CPR for a DNR order, by the letter of law, what has to happen? Yep, it has to be there, filled out, signed, and ready to go. Okay. The, what if it's not there? Or what if their signature's not there? Or what if, like I had one where it was all filled out, it was signed, but it wasn't dated. They just let the date spot blank. Technically, can we follow that? Not really. It's not a legal document at that point. Okay. So what do you do? Are you going to want to do... CPR on this family member, the family's like, they don't want it. You don't, you know the patient doesn't want it. What's your, what's your way out? Medical control. 
And believe me, any medical control doctor is going to have you, they're going to lean to you. Don't start CPR anytime over start CPR on a patient that has a DNR and it was some little technicality that is confusing the scene. Do not start it, okay? Um, but what if it is a valid DNR? You have it on site. You have it there. It's signed. It's dated. It's all there. And the family's like, nope, nope, nope. We're doing CPR. You're saving my your my relative. You doing it or you're not? They're like insistent that you have to do CPR in this. Now, I'll be honest with you. When I first went through um, training, I was told, go ahead and do it. Okay? We don't want to disrupt the scene. We don't want to you know, put yourself in danger or anything like that. Do CPR. Well, there was a um, EMT or a medic, I don't know what their status was, that did this. I want to say it was Southern Idaho where I read this case, but I could be wrong. I could have this state completely screwed up. So they had a patient that had a valid DNR order on site. The family was insistent, nope, you got to do CPR on my relative. So they did, and they saved them. And the patient sued them. And the patient won, and the EMT lost his license. And the agency got a huge financial lawsuit. Because what did they do? They violated a legal document. You do not have the ability to overrule a legal document because somebody's telling you not to. Now, if you have a family that's truly being putting you in what you think is a dangerous situation, then start CPR to save your to, and yeah, you could you could do that too, but get law enforcement involved in that right away. And the minute law enforcement's there, what do you do? You're done. Okay. But don't ever just start CPR because the family's tearful and upset and they don't want their relative to die with a valid DNR order because you do not have the legal authority to not follow that. Okay? Those are obvious. We're going to go over those. We talked about foreign bodies already. I think we're about there because we talked about that already. Oh, we didn't talk about this one. CPR and a pregnant gal. Can do anything different? First of all, it depends how far along she is. If, the, if they're pregnant but not far enough along to even see a belly, do you care? We're talking late-term pregnancy. Big belly. Because what, what position are you going to put her on to do compressions? Her back. What's going to happen with that weight from the fetus and everything in there? Push down on their, you know, yeah, the vena cava is the one we worry about. Okay, so it's reducing the amount of blood flow back to the heart, right? So we need to get that weight off of the vena cava. In mom's chest, where's the vena cava? Middle, right, left. It's right. Okay. Right side of the chest, because it dumps into the right um, atria. It's coming in the right side of the chest. So get the weight off of the middle. Uh, and so you typically go to the left side, get it off the right side of the chest. Um, and really, if you're doing CPR on her, you're going to have to have somebody like in this picture pulling that, holding that weight off while someone else is doing CPR. Now, in trauma, what do they say to do for these gals? If you're not doing the compressions, you actually move them onto their side, right? Um, you have to protect their C-spine and stuff. You might, you know, like on a backboard, prop the whole backboard up or whatever. But in CPR, you can't do that. So you just have to pull the weight of the baby off. All right. And then grief for family members. So families, one thing, the longer you do this, the more you will understand or you more see that there's no consistency to how families react to the death of a family member. I mean, they're so different from every call you go on with how the family reacts. The important thing for us is, as we're doing a code, really to try to get one person linked up with that family to be that advocate, okay? That can be the link between us and them, letting them know how things are going, you know, more often than not, how are things going with a code. 
not good, right? Do we save more of our codes or do we leave them at home? We leave most of them at home. So they can be that one, like, see, they're trying everything they can. They're doing this. They're doing that. And kind of just gearing them up. And then when it finally gets to that point where they're, they've died, letting them know that. Um, but if you happen to be the person that ever gets the unfortunate job of telling a family member that they passed away, that, that, that their loved one has died, really they say the best way to tell them that is that your whoever it is has died. Use those words. People sometimes like to, yeah, they passed, or, we lost them, this happened, and they say that actually makes it confusing for the family member receiving the information at times, or they'll want to believe that's not what you're saying, but it's hard to, if you say your family member has died, it's hard for them to make that mean something else. So you just let them know that they passed away. Do it in a loving way, but the, that your family member has died. Um, and then be ready for how they're going to react. You know, some of them are kind of expected and are fine. Some cry. Some actually get violent, man. I had one. I thought I was going to get punched in the face. We were coding this old guy down in the basement of the house. The, his son, his adult son, was, uh, was upstairs, actually outside of the house having a cigarette talking to the cops on the front porch. So I went out there and let him know that we had stopped resuscitating his father, that his father had died. And he he just took a swing, and it looked like it was coming right from my face. And I had no time to react. I mean, he would have clocked me, but he wasn't aiming at me. He hit the wood post on the porch standing next to me. But I wasn't prepared for that. Um, if he really had decided to hit me, I'd have been knocked flat on my because he was a pretty big guy. But it's pretty amazing. He hit that wood post, and within a couple seconds, he was face down handcuffed. I mean, those cops were on him like that. But... Still, he still would have got a clean head on me. So now I'm still, I'm now I'm more cautious when I tell families that. I, I try to separate myself a little bit more just because you just don't know how they're going to react. All right, practice CPR frequently, obviously. Um, and then another big part of our job in EMS is training the public to do CPR. So, um, that's a great way to keep your skills up. Questions on this one? I know this was a pretty basic chapter that all of you guys are fairly familiar with anyway, but any questions on it? Okay, before I let you go, because we are going to do the skills introduction today, um, I was going to try to grab a, a AED today, and I'll be honest with you, my life's kind of been hectic the last couple of days, and I didn't get it. But I, I'm going to show you a video today that goes over the National Registry BLS station. If anybody wants to, you know, at this point, you guys just need to get to your station, to your crews, and try to practice this skill sheet. Um, but I'm not going to hold you here and do it today because I don't have anything to make you practice with. So that was totally my bad. But I'll at least go over what the skill sheet looks like. I hope this is the one I'd hoped for. Which one? Did you make sure the volume was working? No. Okay. Oh, I can I gotta kill the music. Is that on the pad? This might be the day the music died. Sorry, Jack. I know there was something with how this thing is plugged into. Let's try it and see what happens. Oh. Is one of these guys was how it's plugged in. Oh, that's plugged into the front. Yeah, into the thing that Mitchell's right there. Yeah, it's should be it working. It needs to be plugged into that. The audio. What? Oh, the the yeah. poor audio part. Yep. Yeah, yeah, this guy. Yep, older one. Yep, there it goes. Cardiac arrest management AED station. As 
reminder, this is a 10 minute station. One thing I want to remember when you're performing this skill after your fifth cycle of CPR, make sure you recheck for pulse and breathing. If you don't, your AED will not show up. So with that being said, I have all my equipment, I've looked over everything, I'm ready to do it. We'll spot to it while I find this station line number four. Okay, so my I'm going to speed this up a little bit because they're going to show him actually CPR. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and direct my second respirator to begin CPR. First thing I'm going to do is turn on my AED. I'm going to apply the caps. Shock and Okay. It's a pretty easy station, and I know you guys have all done that before with your EMT Basic. It's the exact same skill sheet they use for the BLS, I mean, as it is for the advanced for this particular station. But any questions on that? All right, I just sent down a, a little roster if you guys just mark down that you're here, otherwise you guys are good to go. Did yeah. Did you talk about skills performance of the IV after I left? Okay. Yes. What did you say? I told them um, after we've gone over any of the skills in class, like the IV example, I want them to get together with some a medic or an I-85 and do IV practice on an arm. Once that person is comfortable with them, they can do it on real patients. And I have a letter I'm going to send out today. Do we have to change their ESO and login? I don't, actually, I don't know that. I told them make sure if it's just to put whoever the – Proctor was as a provider. Aaron put it was started with an, a student with whoever Proctor and them. I haven't talked to the system. I don't know what they want. I never even thought about that until it came up. <laughs> 